In programming, we constantly need to handle information going through our code. This is often a hard task, especially when we are dealing with multiple sources of information and multiple interested parties. This problem often appears in services that talk over the network. In my case, game clients are the sources and receivers of the data. Game server should route incoming packets to specialized classes and handle them. And the other way around, data received from the server is to be funneled to specialized classes in the client. Having one enormous class that checks type of packet in switch case statement and executes a bit of code to handle it, it is an insane amount of work to maintain. You can't find anything or introduce any serious changes to this system because it will fall apart without a ton of duct tape. I know, cause I've been there. I've done it when I first written my MUD C lizard. And believe me, you don't want that. So today we are looking at smarter solution to this mess that will scale nicely when increasing numbers of packet types and handling classes. Bits of code that deal with this problem are commonly called message brokers. They are responsible for transforming the incoming message into format or an object that can be used in the solution. Next step is to route the message to interested party or so-called listener. Brokers can also queue, store the message or add new information, either generated or pulled from another source. In previous video on Lizard, I've talked about protobuf and how I use it to serialize structures that will be sent over the network. That was the transforming step of the broker. Let's have a quick look how it's written and then we'll go over to the routing part. It is built with publisher subscriber design pattern. Oh, and it's using really cool reflection methods to automatically hook up handler bindings. Let's begin. So as you might remember, we have a network server class that raises an event whenever it receives some data from the network. We are given a memory stream and a connection handle. What do we do here? First, we check if we have enough data in the buffer to formulate a packet from protobuf message. And if that's the case, we ask serializer to do it. Next step is to send the parsed translated packet to all the handlers. Let's dig into the serializer. This short method checks if there is enough data in the buffer to read the packet length. And if that's the case, it reads it. If remaining stream length is big enough to contain the packet, we return true. In any case, we restore the stream to its original position. Short and sweet. Going back to main, next step here is to deserialize the stream into the packet class, which is a protobuf contract. So why bother with serializer class if you can put this code straight into the main? Why create a wrapper around perfectly good third party library? Where here is why. Such wrapper gives you two major things. One, you can replace the underlying technology at any point without touching any other part of the system. Nothing but this wrapper knows that I'm using protobuffer. And if there is new cutting edge library that is somehow better, I can just drop it in as a replacement and boom, I'm done. Second thing is the possibility to mock this class instead of mocking the third party library. Chances are that some libraries are not easy to use in unit test scenarios. With a wrapper, you can mock these four methods and you're done. Wrapper itself is also a design pattern and has additional benefits. For example, you can add logging, execution control or queuing. Extend the functionality however you like. More on that in my video on design patterns. Okay, so what is this packet? Well, it's actually a base class for all other packets. It actually performs a function of an interface. But because protobuf requires a public default constructor, packet is an empty class. What packets are we going to have? 
requests and shared objects. Requests are actually commands. Send me this. Set this to that. Clients can send a world request to the server and server should reply with shared object, the world, which client synchronizes against. Okay, let's see how world request looks like. Distance is a simple integer, but position is another protobuf contract. It has a shared object that stores position, but it also can do some operations. It has methods. Proto member attribute tells protobuf to send the field over the network. Fields without it aren't synchronized. Okay, what about the world, the shared object? That is a root object for all zones, which represent unconnected pieces of map. Could be multiple dimensions, realms, separate locations that aren't accessible by foot. Or, and that is my main objective here, generated dungeons and one-off instances that players explore only once. Zone class contains some fields, but most importantly, it contains chunks, which are smaller pieces of the map that will be sent only if player is nearby. Such chunks contain all of the game objects, which are represented by entity class. Solid entities like walls, floors, stairs and so on are to be stored in the tile class. Collectible items and such, of course, will live in the item class. And all the creatures like enemies, NPCs, players, will be part of the character class. Now, here is the interesting part. What kind of methods and fields should be in these? Server needs different methods, read-write access to everything, as it is the source of proof. But client shouldn't be able to alter things. Does it matter if we add server-side methods and fields to the client? I think it does. Client programmers shouldn't worry that they might be using methods intended for server only, even if we label them with some prefix to make it clear. It still introduces clutter that is distracting. There isn't much we can do here. We could wrap this object in another one specific for client or server and then manage the underlying relations on top of what is already happening. As you can guess, it's a mess. Other idea might be to have a separate management structure like dictionary mapping shared object to side specific structure. But I like simpler solutions. I'm adding a field that will store a reference to any object. Think of it as void pointer in C++. On client side, this will contain a reference to client specific object. This will be a Unity 3D game object. On server, it's a container for anything that might be hidden from player, like list of items that NPC has. This field is muted, not sent over the network, as it doesn't matter for the other side. Perhaps there is a better way, but this will work for now. And if I come up with something better, changing it will be very quick. Good, now on to the juicy stuff about publisher and subscriber. This is commonly used design pattern for routing data to interested pieces of code. Let's have a look how it is used and what it does. Again, we start in the connection data event handler and we use method publish to provide packet and connection. So the data and the source. What's going on inside? Whoa, <laughs> dynamic parameters. That is interesting. I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so how publisher subscriber works? Well, it has a map or a dictionary of key value pairs that map some identifier to an action. Identifier can be of any type, an enum, an int, a string. In this case, I use the type class from system namespace. Why? Because protobuf will automatically create an object of the derived class, world or world request, so I can use the type itself as an identifier. 
Whenever I call publish and provide a packet, dictionary will be searched for matching key and assigned action will be called. Such references to methods are called delegates and are the closest thing to function pointers from C++. I can now use subscribe to add new delegates to my dictionary. For now, it only supports one delegate per type but this could be easily changed to have a list of delegates if needed. Good. Wouldn't it be cool if I could just provide a method that accepts world requests as a parameter and c -sharp would just magically call that method without casting back and forth to the parent packet class? This is where keyword dynamic comes in. It is to some extent suspending the static type checking and allows us to postpone this check until the method is called in runtime. Let's see how we would use this. I'm going to create an action that accepts world request and connection and assign a lambda to it. We'll print something in the console here. Now I subscribe to world request, like so. This doesn't have to be a reference to a lambda. It can be a method of a class as long as it is static. Otherwise, we would have to somehow pass the information to which instance we want to send the packet, which is still possible, but a tad more complicated. And that is mostly it. That is how we would use publisher subscriber. However, we can push things even further and have publisher detect methods that are meant to accept and handle packets. I have a class world request subscriber which has such a method. It will generate random world with some mazes for me. So I have created this thing above the signature of this method. It's an attribute. Attributes are markers that you can put on methods, fields and classes. They don't do anything on their own. They are simple classes that inherit from system.reflection.attribute. However, you can use said reflection in your runtime to scan for these attributes and then do something to methods that have them. This is what find static subscriber methods is doing. It scans through your program and reads every type, checks if it is a class, and if it has found this attribute, it will create a delegate and store it in the dictionary of actions. The code looks complex, but it really isn't. Feel free to stop the video and analyze it. Now, you might have heard that reflection is slow and shouldn't be used. This is true to some extent. It is important to understand that while the process of finding the subscribers is slow, it happens only once when server starts. We create the delegates once and we use them throughout the lifetime of the application. If we were to search for them every time we get a packet, it would be a nightmare. That is it, fellow devs. We can now add hundreds of packet handlers and never think about them again. This system is extremely easy to extend or to replace with something more performant if need be, like switch case statement. So good luck with your projects and don't forget to subscribe down there. It is as easy as clicking the button. So do it, do it. See you in the next one. Cheers.